welcome uh, Gizzy Roberts. She's a graduate student with the University of Missouri. She's going to talk to you about the survey, a survey of relationships among rare breeds of swine. And I'll let you introduce yourself, at least okay. briefly. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, yeah, my name is Kizzy Roberts. I am a graduate student here at the University of Missouri. Um, today, I'll be presenting part of my research, which was funded through uh, a graduate student grant from SARE. And we'll be looking at relationships among rare breeds of swine and also the importance of those relationships. So I'll start off with a little bit on breed diversity. Currently, there are over 70 different breeds of pigs around the world. Um, however, in the US, with uh, the advancement of vertical integration uh, within the industry, the actual number of breeds that are currently used on large-scale production is very low. There's um, about seven that are very popular. Uh, and that's driven by consumer demand for a lean, uniform product. And so the Yorkshire or the large white, Landrace, Chester White, Duroc, Berkshire, uh, Hampshire, and Spot are the seven breeds currently used by most uh, large-scale operations. So the American Livestock Breed Conservancy uh, recognizes that breed diversity is an important aspect um, of livestock production. And so they were founded to protect rare breeds of livestock and poultry. So uh, they are working to protect approximately 180 different livestock and poultry breeds. So uh, the main reason we're interested in breed diversity is um, the, to preserve genetic diversity. Uh, so in industry breeds, since they're raised for a similar purpose, they uh, share similar genetic makeup. Uh, they're bred to, to thrive in a specific environment, which is mainly a confined feeding operation. The less popular breeds and also the older heritage type breeds um, and some rare breeds that we're going to talk about are uh, generally more genetically diverse and therefore they're able to tolerate uh, varied living conditions, uh, harsh environments. They are more disease resistant and uh, more self-sufficient, requiring less management in general. Um, also, many of these less popular breeds and older breeds uh, have many unique traits that are not found in industry breeds. And so the ALBC lists seven critical swine breeds. Uh, they're defined as critical as having fewer than 200 registered each year in the US. And so from this list, we selected three that we felt we had the um, best ability to gain access to for DNA samples. So we selected the Guinea hog, the Asaba Island, and the red wattle. And today, we'll actually be focusing on the research involving the guinea hog. Um, so guinea hogs are characterized as small, hardy pigs. Their mature size is around 100 pounds. They are excellent foragers. And they're also characterized by a high fat content, which is one of the reasons maybe they're less popular um, because we are, the industry looks for a lean pig today. They are good for subsistence farming due to their small size and their ability to thrive in harsh environments or uh, where there's very rough forage. The Asaba Island hog is, uh, comes from an isolated feral herd on Asaba Island. They are also a small, hardy pig, uh, av mature size about 100 pounds. And they are characterized by very large fat stores. Um, and, it, and it is this reason that they're actually a good model for non-insulin dependent diabetes in humans. Red wattle are actually very large pigs, uh, six to 800 pounds. I believe I saw some out there. Uh, they're also very hardy. Uh, and they're characterized by a rapid growth rate in comparison to other uh, rare breeds or heritage type breeds. Uh, they have a lean, tender, flavorful meat and a mild temperament. So uh, some challenges of conserving these breeds are that they aren't as popular and this is due to consumer demand for um, you know, a lean, uniform product. And many of these breeds are characterized by a small carcass, high fat, fat content, and a relatively slow growth rate. 
Uh, they also, the, the breed population is fairly small for most of these. Um, so it's difficult, difficult for farmers to find the animals to purchase if they're wanting to raise them. Um, also, there aren't as many small pig farmers uh, due to the more intensive management that pigs require um, as compared to, say, like a small beef cattle farm. Um, also, the uh, small herd size. So um, many of these, these farmers that are raising them have very small herds as compared to large confined feeding operations. So there can also be a lack of pedigree information on these pigs. Uh, many of these are very old heritage type breeds. Um, when they were initially founded, there maybe wasn't a formal breed organization. So we don't have a lot of that paperwork um, to trace their history back. Um, and, and due to this lack of pedigree information, um, we, we get reduced genetic diversity because we're breeding very small populations. Um, uh, we get a lot of inbreeding. And so uh, not knowing the relationships of the animals makes planning matings very difficult um, and ultimately reducing breed viability over time. So inbreeding is uh, just defined as a high level of homozygosity. Um, so there's, there's more of the same kinds of alleles in the population. So this allows undesirable or lethal alleles to be expressed within a population. And they can also become more concentrated within the population. And uh, having more of similar alleles uh, reduces genetic diversity and then ultimately in the long term reduces breed viability. So the objective of this research project is to determine relationships among rare breeds of pigs when uh, the pedigree data is incomplete or unknown uh, so that to give farmers um, a better plan for matings in order to reduce inbreeding. And then ultimately we'd like to compare the rare, rare breeds to each other and to industry breeds in order to see which are the more genetically diverse, which are more similar to industry breeds, um, and, uh, and how they all relate to each other. So the, the method of analysis consists of collecting DNA samples in the form of hair samples uh, from each of the three breeds we've selected. Um, we, we really only need 10 to 11 animals per breed to get a, a basic idea of uh, the, the breed relation to each other. And then obviously, if we wanted to look into more um, of how individuals are related to each other, well, we'd need DNA samples from each of those individuals. And then the samples are then genotyped at GeneSeq, and then when we get that data back, we can then determine the relationships from the genotypes. So just a quick little genetics review. Uh, so DNA is composed of four nucleotides, um, represented as A, T, G, and C. And the sequence of these nucleotides in the DNA is important because um, the sequence is what codes for different genes. So in pigs, we have 38 pairs of chromosomes. So um, there are two forms of the gene, one form of, so each chromosome has one form of the gene on it. And so those two forms could be the same or they could be different. Um, so let's say we have a form A, which is allele A, and a form B, allele B. And so uh, then the animal's genotype is determined by which alleles it, it carries. So in this diagram we have, so each of these represents a chromosome. And so on this chromosome, we have an allele for purple flowers, and on this chromosome, an allele for white flowers. And then we also get into dominance and recessives. So if purple flowers was dominant, then the flower would be purple. Um, so in this case, we have a heterozygous individual, right? Because it has one copy of each allele. Uh, homozygous would mean that it has two forms of the same allele. So we would get um, AA, or this would be purple purple, or white, white, or BB. So, um, so therefore, there are three possible genotypes. So how this relates to what we're doing is we're looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms. So the nucleotides, again, are the, the base pairs in the DNA. Um, and so a, a SNP is what it's called, is a, a, when a, a change occurs in a single nucleotide in the DNA. And so this then creates two different forms 
of an allele. So we'd have an A allele or a B allele. And in this picture, you can see we have the sequence of DNA, and then here we have a change. So this would be the SNP giving us one form of the allele that will have a T, and the other form would have a C. So we would expect that uh, related individuals would have a similar genetic makeup, meaning they would have more SNPs, more alleles in common. So we use the Swine 60K SNP chip, which means that uh, we're genotyping over 60,000 sites across, the, across 3 billion base pairs in the DNA. And so the genotypes come to us in a, like a spreadsheet, and they're coded as A for, one, for homozygous, H for heterozygous, and B for the other homozygous form. And so then with this in matrix form, we can, uh, the SNP data can be used to measure levels of hetero or homozygosity in, in the animals. So this is an example of just a short, um, very small like, um, piece of, uh, of a larger spreadsheet, right? So across the top, these are all um, s different SNPs. And so this would extend for 60 plus thousand, right? Um, it's a giant spreadsheet. And in this case, we just have, um, these are all the animals though that we looked at. These are all guinea hogs. Um, and so you can see in like that first column, they all have the same s allele at that location. They're all homozygous for um, the, the B form of that gene. And then in the next column, we see that, well, all of them are alike except for Samson. He's heterozygous. So you can see that um, just, I mean, just looking at this, that he's less related to the rest of them than they are to each other. And then here we have Houdini, who is the odd one out, um, with a heterozygous and the rest being homozygous. And then we have uh, Houdini and Samson. In this case, both have a heterozygous um, genotype, whereas the rest are all homozygous. So, so this is what I'm looking at across all 60,000 SNPs, right? So <coughs> through calculations, um, I don't go through each one individually, like that would take forever. Um, but we get a count of similar homozygous alleles, right? Because that's what we're interested in. We want to know um, how what the homozygosity is, because that indicates a reduction in genetic diversity and indi indicates an increase in, in levels of inbreeding. So we're assuming that uh, a higher number of similar alleles between two individuals would indicate a closer relationship. And so uh, through some calculations, we can ultimately express this as a proportion or a percentage um, of, the, of shared alleles based on the total, out of the total number of SNPs. So we can see, uh, highlighted in yellow, so this is the diagonal of the matrix, um, and those numbers indicate the proportion of homozygosity within an individual animal. So like the first wart side sow, he, or she maybe, um, had 74% homozygosity in, in the SNPs that were looked at. So 74% of the alleles are homozygous. Um, and then you can see that for Samson, he has a, a much lower level of homozygosity with only about half of his alleles being um, homozygous. So then if we look at some of these other numbers, so these all indicate, all of these numbers on the off diagonal indicate the percentage of uh, similar alleles, homozygous alleles between individuals, right? So for the big old stiff boar and wart side sow, they share 62% of, of their alleles are similar. Whereas if we look at um, Samson and wart side sow, only just under 30%. It's a pretty big difference. So uh, based off this, our initial step was to just put them into families, kind of, um, not very precise as far as like the relationships between individuals, but just to get an idea of, of how these uh, order out into some families. So we based this off of um, ones that had higher numbers of shared alleles. So again, this didn't give us uh, precise levels of relatedness, but 
um, I could tell you that family two is much more closely re related to each other than um, they are to the individuals in family four. So from this, just from those animals, we came up with, um, with five different families. But then uh, the producer that we were working with, we wanted to be able to tell him, um, like, you know, uh, Samson and family one actually is related to members of family four. Because from this, you might think that we have five completely unrelated families, and that's not necessarily the case. So uh, in order to kind of calibrate our, our system, um, and calculate more precise relationships, we took a sampling of pigs with known relationships. So I had um, full pedigrees on these pigs, and they were actually industry breeds. And so we calculated both the relationships of the pigs based off of the pedigree, and then also had them genotyped and calculated the relationships based off of um, what, we're, what we're doing, what I showed you with the, with the genotype, with the SNP data. And so from that, we were able to, to kind of create a formula and plug in the number of shared uh, alleles from the guinea hogs into this formula and come up with more precise relationships. So, so in this case, now when we see a decimal place of like 0.5 or around 0.5, that indicates that the, the animals have a relationship. Yes. Oh, four. oh thank you. <laughs> um, similar to a sibling or a parent offspring relationship. So, so here we can kind of see that um, we have fairly high levels of, you know, there are a lot of numbers over 0.5. So we have a lot, uh, there's some levels of inbreeding, right? If we have animals that are, have a greater relationship than, than full siblings or parent offspring. Um, but then we also see we, we have some that aren't unrelated. Samson is unrelated to, to Seymour. So uh, with some research, I was actually able to to find a partial pedigree for these guinea hogs. Um, so here's what I constructed from what I found. And uh, a little example family tree. And just from this, you can already see there's some inbreeding present as DNC George and DNC Chunky are uh, half siblings. So uh, this is kind of an example of the calculations um, of the relationships based just off the pedigree using all the animals, and I've highlighted the animals that we actually have the SNP data for. So here, um, in this table, we just did a, a, like a, the pedigree, the calculated relationship of the pedigree versus uh, what we came up with with our SNP calculation. And in many cases, uh, the, the actual relationship with, from the SNP is, is higher than what we expected based on the pedigree. And this is due to incomplete pedigrees, right? And and this is, our SNP information is very helpful pr for producers because um, based off a of pedigree, we might think that Seti Lily and the big boar are uh, not very related at all. But then we look at our SNP relationship and it's 0.83. So you would, without expecting to, you would get a very high level, level of inbreeding within those, the offspring of that pairing. So our future work will be to determine the relationships in the Asaba Island and the red wattle pigs, and then how those relate to the guinea hogs and each other, um, comparing SNPs across breeds. And we'd also like to compare these to industry breeds um, to get a more complete picture of the origin of these breeds and see you know, how maybe these heritage breeds uh, way back have actually influenced in industry breeds today. Um, and then we'd like to, you know, provide this information to producers so that they can uh, reduce um, possible matings that would uh, increase inbreeding within the breed um, and others that are interested in the conservation of these breeds. So I'd like to thank uh, SARE for providing the funding for this research and a the work working with ALBC, Jeanette Berenger and Allison Martin. Um, and then my professor, Dr. Bill Lamberson, the producers who provided samples, Cheryl Fanning, Kevin Fall, and Robert Long, and then uh, some graduate students. And I'll take any questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, Chester White, no, they're actually... 
Yes, uh, he's asking if the Tamworth, the Horford, and the Chester White were how they rank or considered rare breeds. Uh, Chester White is not. It's a um, very popular breed used extensively in the industry. Uh, Hereford and Tamforth, I believe, are considered rare. Um, I don't know as far as like the level of of rare, but yes, they're considered rare. Yes. Um, how many years till the research is available or, or um, well, we've already had this information out to the producer that provided the samples. So he's been able to, yes, yeah, yes, yes, we're, we're actually, we're going to work with extension and have the information, um, available to anybody that, that wants it. Um, I mean, if you wanted this, you could have it, uh, but all we really have um, that's really ready is just these few animals from the, the guinea hogs. But, but yeah, if you wanted the information on the guinea hogs, you could. Um, it would depend on uh, money for it, or if you had money available to pay for the genotyping, um, then I don't know, a, a few months you could have the information. <laughs>